Welcome to the Environmental Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Grady, and today's guest is Carrie Gonzalez. Carrie is the president and CEO of MXV Rail, the world's premier rail research advisory. Since taking the role in 2021, Carrie has spearheaded the company's transformation from TTCI to MXV Rail. She's been a part of the MXV Rail and a subsidiary of the Association of American Railroads since 2000, advancing from a student intern to research engineer to, and transitioning to vice president and CFO before assuming the role of president and CEO just recently. Carrie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Carrie, give us a little background on MXV Rail for the listeners and educate us a little bit about what you guys do. Perfect. I like to say that MXV Rail is the research arm of the North American railroads. Uh, okay. We get to do a lot of work on behalf of the railroads, really aimed at increasing safety, reliability, efficiency, and resiliency in our industry. Okay. So where are you guys located? Uh, we are located in Pueblo, Colorado. We just made a very big transition from the old a uh, federally owned facility to a new facility that's uh, privately owned and okay. but still located in beautiful Pueblo, Colorado. Okay. All right. That's awesome. So most of the clients that you serve are emergency responders, uh, the railroad industry, uh, maybe uh, is there firefighters involved? Tell me who the target audience for your clients are. Perfect. So we serve a wide variety of people in our industry. Um, our research and testing business is really focused on the railroads, suppliers, vendors, and that's both um, domestically and globally. So we have a lot of work with international customers as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of those people are looking at bringing product to us to help run it through the paces to make sure that it's ready for revenue service. So one of the things that distinguishes us from other organizations is that we do not make any products. So we don't provide product to the industry. Okay. We really are an independent third party assessor of all things geared at taking those ideas into implementation. Uh, on the first responder side, we actually have a, a piece of our business. It's called the Security and Emergency Response Training Center, or okay. CERTSI. Okay. CERTSI has been around since the mid-80s, uh, and we're really focused on training first responders on techniques to respond to incidents that happen via hazmat. And that could be rail, pipeline, highway. It really spans surface transportation in terms of what we train for. Uh, during, since our inception of the CERTSI program, we've trained over 76,000 first responders. Wow. Okay. That's, that's impressive. So you are here at the uh, Rail Hazmat Thought Leadership Summit. And there's been a lot of organizers uh, from FEMSA and others that, that have been uh, brought together. There's about 85 or so members here at the conference today. So what do you kind of hope to gain from attending the conference? From our side, we're really trying to understand where there are gaps in training or access to first responders so that, number one, we understand what the need is. Uh, our programs, were, we work closely with FEMA uh, through the National Domestic Preparedness Consortium, or NDPC. Okay. Uh, so we do get grant funding to help train first responders. All of those programs are certified by FEMA, so um, they are great classes. And we just want to make sure that we're building resilient programs and and really making them accessible to first responders. So things that I'm expecting to learn out of this conference, number one is, you know, what are local communities struggling with? Because we do have lots of representation from localities, but also um, what types of training are going to be most beneficial to help prepare our first responders? Yeah, I mean, there seems to be a lot of uh, discussion around the training gaps and um, at this at this summit here and, and what what should be done to kind of shore up consistency, I think, in the overall training deployment of material. That seems to be a theme that I'm hearing. How do you guys develop your curriculum for your classes? So lucky for us, we have some phenomenal instructors with great backgrounds in uh, the different modes of transportation. And so it really starts with their fundamental knowledge of the things that they've experienced out in the field. Uh -huh. um, most of our um, most of our instructors have had past experience in rail or firefighting. Uh, so they really do bring that experience in and help us develop what types of programs would be beneficial based on what they've seen. Uh -huh. um, so we also take that information and work again with FEMA to make sure that 
we're capturing the right sized audience that we're going to be able to deploy the information across the entirety of the U.S. And so uh, really finding those areas of interest. Uh, one example of that was probably 15 years ago when crude by rail was starting to be transported yeah. um, more frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked with uh, FEMA and the class ones to develop a new program. Uh, we spun that up in like four months and got first responders starting to get trained. I think in that first year, we trained over 600 students in response to CBR incidents. It may happen. Oh, wow. That's that's great. I mean, you guys are, sounds like you're pretty flexible and, and, and nimble in a way to respond to, you know, a crisis of training needs in the industry. So that's really cool. Absolutely. How many different trainers do you have on staff? Uh, right now we have about 12 different trainers. Uh, most of them can train in all of the programs that we have. Um, but we do have some very, uh, some specialists, one in particular that's uh, very rail centric. So um, we try and keep them assigned to the courses where they have the strongest background. Uh, but we've also been deploying the some remote classes. Last year, we worked with FEMA to develop a remote, like very high level four to eight hour uh, course that's helped us to get out into the communities. Mm -hmm. One of the struggles that we've seen, and I, I don't know necessarily know if it's a gap, but actually getting the responders to come to our classes because there's no one to backfill while they're gone. Yeah. So we kind of adapted to the the needs and started to go out into the communities and work with individual communities to deploy some training in hopes that they see the value in it, number one, and, and will attend some of the more hands-on because we do think the hands-on is important. Right. But we've been able to train a lot more people, at least at the fundamental, like, high level safety awareness class. So is it, so it's like an online, you register and then, uh, is it like a zoom call type scenario or is it, no. is it like self paced? No, we actually go out. So we have oh, okay. our instructors that will go out. Uh, typically we're working with the chiefs, um, or some of the, uh, state representatives to find out where we're, where they're needed. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll send two instructors out there for about three day period. And we're trying to get through shifts, um, okay. trying to get deploy this training for the people that are coming in um, through those shifts. So I'm curious your thoughts on how digital technology can help you in training, especially maybe more of the general awareness or tactical type training, maybe with the use of uh, mixed reality or, or virtual reality. What's your thoughts on how the industry is moving in that direction? Certainly. And I think that really gets to the point of relevancy, right? Um, as we're bringing in a new demographic of people, I think that their expectations on how they're trained and how they're going to learn is going to be different. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that we're going to need to adapt our training. Now, I will say that I don't think that the full experience of the hands-on training that we have is ever, the need for that is ever going to go away. Yeah, I would um, agree. Because it's just yeah. something different when you're working in virtual reality than when you're actually going through an exercise that, you know, you have a tank car on fire, like there's yeah. lots of things yeah. that look different. Um, <laughs> but I do think it is going to become a very good supplement, especially to tackle that problem that yeah. we were just talking about in terms of availability of people to actually be able to train. Right. Yeah. It seems that um, having modules that uh, maybe if, if there's like a gamification of training, so to speak, for new firefighters coming into the industry, uh, the younger generation seems to be kind of queued up in, into being very successful at playing games. I mean, they're gamers, right? right? So right. they learn and, and can actually, uh, I guess, I think learn better in that environment. Yeah. I think they're more accessible or they want to be uh, accessing the information that way versus right. in person. Um, but I do think you, they're not, you're never going to replace in person yeah. you know, or the actual like uh, field application of some situations, Certainly. right? So. Well, and just, you know, kind of going back to the instructors that we have, um, you know, during training, it is not just, you know, here's point A, here's point B. There's so much storytelling, right. not only from our instructors, but also from the conversations that are going on with the yeah. people that are attending the training. And so I do think it's very important that we keep we can supplement, but we can't replace. And yeah. I think that needs to just be a constant consideration. I know my team is probably going to listen to this and they are going to be like, half of them are going to be super excited and be like, yes, we're going to get to explore some. We're going to do some happens. virtual reality stuff. And this the, could be the great. The other half is going to just groan about like, it. No, like, oh, uh, this is never yeah. right. So it, I think that's the feel that you're going to get. But I think once you get something that's functional and, and provides the right level and your expectations aren't too high around it, 
uh, I think there's going to be a good balance. Yeah, I, I kind of I agree with you because I think there's certain types of training aspects of general awareness. I mean, some of the very specific stuff, you're probably going to need to be that really hands on. But you could probably get away with quite a bit of some general stuff oh, with certainly. virtual and, and that'll really kind of expedite some awareness training or I guess annual renewal type stuff right. that needs to be done on a regular basis that will kind of click the box, but give good content and accessible. Or so. even on demand, right? Yeah, this, this, or on demand, right. One of the things that we know in our industry is that these incidents don't happen very often, right? right. Some responders will never experience having to respond to one of these incidents because they're so infrequent. Right. But in the event that you need it and there's a tool there that's easily accessible to do a quick refresh if something does happen yeah they I got hey i got a cruise i need to get out there yeah. can and they're not trained yet so let's get them online and, and right. then you know they could do it in a day and then the next day they're moved out to the site right that's, and not to say they're going to be perfect but at least they have uh, some, general some, awareness some general awareness <laughs> well they probably maybe already have taken the course before just they just let it lapse sure. yeah, yeah you know let's i think y'all we all need to kind of stay current on our training and education or you know it's like the use it or lose it right certainly i have yeah. a i have a few safety trainings that need to be refreshed right now through our organization so i get that <laughs> <laughs> one of the themes that i heard in the breakout sessions uh yesterday was the concern about the level of experience of the trainers uh, I heard some frustrations from some of the groups and, and some of the people in my group where they were not very happy with trainers that just, they could train. They had no experience in the industry and they're just teaching off a of PowerPoint right. and, and don't have the practical experience to address a question that comes through. What, what does that look like for you when you're hiring your trainers and, and evaluating them coming into your organization and, and selecting people who really have like real tried and true experiences so that they could relate to the responders and the, the people they're teaching. Right. So we rely heavily on our team to find individuals that have the background that we need. And when I say background, depending on what roles or what courses we're expecting them to teach, we're really looking for, you know, if it's highway courses, we want somebody that's been exposed to some highway yeah. um, incident or training or whatnot. Um, I think the other element of it is just having engaging instructors. So making sure that they know how to speak to an audience. Um, some of those skills can be learned though. So if you have a strong background in sure. in the areas we're looking for, we can help you along with the presentation. As long as you have like that, that, that yeah. desire and passion to do it, um, yeah. we can teach that. But I do think that that's what distinguishes our curriculum and our training from others because we do have people that have been in the field working in the field um, that again can relate through I'm showing you this but let me tell you how this actually works when yeah. you're in a field scenario yeah yeah I mean I love walking into our courses and one of our instructors Kelly Bozarth I mean he uses like the most random like he has racquetballs and tennis balls and he's like you can do this with and you're like what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> but it, I mean those are the things that you have to be creative mm -hmm. and work with what you have in a field environment, understand the implications of the choices you're making. Uh, so he really connects well with students. And again, he has a really broad background in fire um, and he's just adapted really well. So it's important to have a strong background in the um, the field, but also be able to speak to people yeah. and relate with them. Uh, and if any of y'all are out there looking and, and that sings to your heart, I'm going to do a quick little pitch to say we're always looking for good people and good instructors. She needs so trainers. I need trainers. Uh, we, like I said, we just hired one. I know we're going to be hiring another uh, one or two later this year. So oh, that's keep good. an eye out. Well, I think that was another message that kind of came out in our little roundtables yesterday was, it's great if you've got somebody who's got a lot of real true practical experience, but they're a horrible trainer. Yeah. Right. So you it, it's a fine balance and it and it's a unique individual who can, you know, really communicate their experiences in a training and be, you know, kind of a teacher. Right. And so it's good that you found a few that, that are able to do that. And, and it really translates well with education and, and I think retention too. people who go to a class. They're like, OK, I get it now. Right. And, um, well, really and good. interest to come back. So we have a lot of our students that will come back and take other courses or come back and get refreshed after three or five years. So 
Um, and I think with this move, for those of you that have been students before and want to come back, we have brand new scenarios that you've never seen before. So I do encourage people to come back and, and see us now that we're in our new facilities. Because well, yeah, talk about your new facility and what's, what's going to be available to them. Yeah, so um, right now we have running six different courses. Most of the interest has been in our highway response and tank car response. Mm -hmm. I am happy to announce that for those of you that were waiting for flammable liquids to come back, uh, this is where we get to light the whole derailment uh, on fire. Okay, cool, um, cool. That is going to be back. <laughs> we're going to be piloting that course in October okay. and um, rolling that out in November and December will be the first courses. So look for registration on that. But um, new facility, it's about 150 acres. Um, oh, wow. We have our full scale train derailment. We have highway scenarios. We have all the hands on um, smaller parts and pieces. So vent and burn, all the good things are have been shifted over and honestly refreshed. So we were really fortunate to take advantage of this time frame to modernize the equipment that we had. So um, no longer are you getting tank cars from 20 years ago, you're getting more of the modern look at those. So all in all, the student experience has been significantly enhanced, uh, not only from the classroom environment where we have new state-of-the-art technology uh, in combination with our phenomenal training staff, but um, also in our big scenarios. So we're excited about it and we've been happy to be operational since I think uh, our first classes were in November of 2022 and we're just keeping getting better. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, okay. So that's awesome. What's the response for the contractors who come out or the, the students that come out and, and they're able to actually do real burns and get their hands dirty and suit up? And what's that experience like for them? Oh, I, you will always see smiles on Thursdays when those <laughs> uh, big scenarios are going on. I do think that it's one of a kind. I know there's a couple of other places that do it, just not the scale that we do it. Uh, and so I don't think that anybody's walked away from any of our courses saying, well, that just wasn't very much fun. Yeah. Um, they just, I think they get a whole new level of learning. And when you talk about retention, there's nothing like remembering that time that you were right. actually in it and working on it. And there's smoke coming out and water blasting in your face if you do something wrong. Um, those are the real key learning points. Well, how many different certificates of classes do you offer? Uh, right now we have six classes that we have online uh, when the flammable liquids, and it's actually flammable liquids and alternative fuels uh, okay. with all of the green energy work that's going on. We thought it was important to add that element. So we'll have another one online there. So um, yeah, about seven total. Okay. All right. And then do they... Are they like two, three, four day courses a week? Or what's the it, length of most of them? It depends. I would say majority of them are three to five day, but we do have a two week course that's available. So I would say depending on the time that you have uh, and your interests, um, you can look at any one of those. All of our class descriptions and registration information is on our website at certsy.org. Uh, so feel free to go and explore that. And if you have any questions, get in contact with our team. I'm sure we could help answer them. Uh, those are the registered courses. If you're a business looking to train your employees or a set of contractors in a specific area, we also do contract courses where we okay. can customize the things that we have according to your needs. So um, you can also get in touch with our staff via website to explore how we might be able to support you there. Oh, that's great. That's great. And so get then get all the information on off your website. What are the some of the uh, things you're looking to take away from the conference here? I mean, generally, we've had some phenomenal discussions already. I think that I've heard a lot of need in terms of increasing visibility for communities. And we've been working really hard at that, but we need to be better. Uh, I don't think that they understand the resources that are available from a training perspective. So um, I thought that was interesting, but I really like to get some additional takeaways for us as a training school to make sure that we're leading the way in terms of um, what content is needed. Uh -huh. And again, to your point, like how people are learning nowadays. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's one of the biggest things I'm going to be having a conversation with my team, like, okay, this is good, but how can we make it better based on the de demands that people are facing today and the way that they're learning? So do you also provide trainings around, like maybe the more traditional type of training, say the DOT refresher or a RECRA, ASMAC type refresher? 
you do any of those or is it more specific to real hazmat response type activities? Yeah, most of what we do is more on the latter half okay. of that. But I mean, our people are totally capable of doing yeah. those types of training. We just know that there's so many offerings and different sure. avenues for people to get those. Um, but if somebody wanted to bring a contract course and wanted that particular piece taught within that course, we absolutely have gotcha. the, the ability to do that. Well, that's great. It sounds like an amazing location. You're in Pueblo, Colorado. Yes. How do people get a hold of you, Carrie? Well, there's lots of ways to get a hold of us. Uh, we are very active for Certsy on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, MXV Rail is also very active on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, Certsy.org, mxvrail.com, or if you want to just look me up, uh, Carrie Gonzalez on uh, LinkedIn, I'd be happy to point you in the right direction. Well, I'll also put a link to your contact information on my website. And so people are listening, you can get a hold of Carrie that way as find, finding your information. And uh, we'll look forward to uh, promoting the podcast interview and getting this, some, you know, the message out about MXV. Yeah, perfect. And one more thing before we go, I think the one thing I forgot to mention to everybody on this is that the training that we're providing through NDPC is absolutely free. Oh, so okay. for first responders that are eligible, uh, you have to work with your SAAs, but you get registered. And from the time you leave your house to the time you return to your house, all of the um, time and travel, all, all the costs associated with the travel is is paid for by the NDPC grant. So um, oh. make sure you are taking advantage of this free training. <laughs> oh, that is a very key piece of information. I'm glad you brought that up. So is that also information that's on the website for people to you know get? Okay, yep. great. Our website will direct you through the process to get the approval, and our team works with you to make sure that we're getting all the flight information and hotels all taken care of for you. So. So if you want free training, free training, you right call here. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Carrie. All right. Thank you so much.